Isaiah chapter 10. If you need a Bible, there are plenty around uh, in, the, in the chairs. So please avail yourself because what we will be preaching this evening will be from the Scripture. We want you to know that. We believe what the Bible says about itself, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It's profitable for doctrine. It's profitable for proof. It's profitable for correction. It's profitable for instruction in righteousness. And the purpose of it is so that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. It isn't a wonderful thing that God not only saves us and takes us from a place where what we can do is only fake with regard to good works. Good deeds it, to, to impress God are just things that are nothing more short that are nothing short of arrogance, literally our pretending to God that we do not need the sacrifice of the cross of Jesus Christ. But because of Jesus Christ, God has made it so that we stand before Him righteous. And that those things that we do for the Lord Jesus Christ do uh, become good works. Aren't you glad that the Bible then tells us how we can know how to do good works? I want to work for Jesus, don't you? I want to accomplish something in my life that matters more than just in this temporary time that I walk this earth. I want my life to matter forever. And God's Word instructs us how to do that. Well, if you found Isaiah chapter 10, please look with me down to verse 20. And uh, as you look down to verse 20, uh, we're going to just read a short passage of Scripture and really hopefully this evening have a pretty pretty concise message uh, that I think is very, very important that we get the idea of. The Bible says, And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. For though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return, yet the consumption decreed shall overflow with righteousness. For the Lord God of hosts shall make a consumption even determined in the midst of the land. Well, let's pray and ask God to help. God, please help us to understand your word this evening. And by understanding your word, more importantly, God, to understand you. And as we look at a people who are, were at the time being sent into judgment because of their unwillingness to rest on you, Father, I pray that you'd help us to look at ourselves and see those same characteristics as they're manifested in our daily life so that, Father, we could correct them and so that we, being reproved, could be more like Jesus and be profitable to serve. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are, and we are looking at the prophecy. This, of course, would have been before Israel's captivity into Babylon, but the prophecy of Judah's fall, Israel and Judah's fall. And uh, as we saw last week, we saw that uh, the answer that many of us have regarding the real important question of why does God sometimes seem as though he allows evil? We see what the Assyrians did. You know, many times it seems as though in, when, we, when we're being judged or chastised, sometimes it seems as though the persons, if they're, they're an instrument of God, judging or chastising us are worse than we are. And this would certainly be true of the Assyrian king or the king of Assyria. The king of Assyria was so arrogant that he said in his heart when he was planning to go into Judah, he said, you know what, I'm going to destroy the gods of Judah just the same way that I destroyed the gods, and he lists all the, the different countries that he destroyed the gods of those countries of. And in his mind, he was including Jehovah God. Now, we pointed out last week how, how tragic it was that a nation which had had supernatural God do so many abundant, miracle, miraculous riches and provide for them, provide so many promises to them, it's too bad that they worship idols, isn't it? And yet, God was going to use the king of Assyria to destroy the idols. Would have been better, don't you think, if they, if the Israelites had destroyed their own idols? Maybe a father would say uh, to to a husband would say to a wife, or a wife would say to a husband, or a father would say to children, "We're not going to have those things. We're going to worship God as we promised God we would. We want God's blessing. We've had God's blessing, and we're going to worship only God." But uh, Israel, in every way, worshipped other gods. But this arrogant king of Assyria, this arrogant Assyrian king, 
thought that it was in his own strength and his own power, literally his own invincibility, that he was able to judge God's people. And he felt as though because uh, the people that were called by God were uh, made vulnerable or actually being destroyed by himself, that he was greater than God himself. And God used a couple of illustrations. The first illustration was a rod, uh, like a rod in the hand of a person. Uh, it, the king of Assyria is a rod in my hand. In other words, a rod can cause harm or hurt, but it can only cause harm or hurt as it's wielded. A rod without something to move it or to activate it can't do anything. So like an axe to a tree. You know, an axe boasting itself or bragging about how powerful it is to a tree. The fact of the matter is an axe is powerless over a tree unless it's the instrument in the hands of a person who wields it. The same with a saw. A saw may say, hey, listen to how powerful I am cutting through wood, and yet a saw is pointless or worthless without somebody to operate the saw. And what God is saying to the king of Assyria, you think that you are so powerful and mightier than God himself because you're being used as an instrument to judge God's people, but hear this, when I'm through using you to judge God's people, I'll judge you. My friend, there's a reminder that God does not forget any evil, and when you get frustrated and you feel as though, why does God judge me, but he doesn't judge evildoers? Well, it is important, is it not, that God judge his own before he judges the wicked, those who do not acknowledge him? And it is also important that God is merciful. Do you recognize that from the beginning of creation, God has always, always provided in his long suffering the opportunity for individuals to repent of evil and provided the opportunity for them to turn from their hard hearts and to repent? There's one uh, concept that I want to look at this evening, though, that's just uh, insightful about human nature as well as helps us to understand what God wants from His children. And so look at verse 20, if you will, with me now. And uh, we're going to read verse 20 again. The Bible says, It shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon him that smote them but shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. Now, before we look at what it means to stay upon the Lord of Israel, or the Holy One of Israel, let's just look at simply, or just to do a little explanation of what God is explaining. There is a time when all Israel is going to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. We recently on Sunday morning saw that in Romans chapter 11, and verse 16, or 26. And so all Israel shall be saved and uh, shall come. Uh, and and the, the, in Revelation we've seen that as God is finally judging the whole world for wickedness, there are 12,000 of each of the 12 tribes of Israel who refuse to take the mark of the beast and who instead take the mark of God on themselves. And they worship God and they come to God. God teaches them uh, to sing a song, the song of Moses, and teaches them to sing the song of the Lamb. And as the world turns against them and comes to destroy them, they come and are gathered together in the valley of Megiddo. And as they're gathered there, they come to their God and He is their protector. And He destroys the wicked ones and they are universally spared. They are the only ones who are spared of judgment, those that are part of that 144,000 or those that come with the 144,000 as well. And so what do, we, what do we understand from that? Well, there's going to be a time when all Israel is saved. That is, as a nation, it will occur what has never in time past ever happened. Sometimes we think about the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness, uh, that they were believers in God. And certainly some among them were. But you know, it's very interesting that the judgment for the children of Israel was that their carcasses would drop off in the wilderness, and it was because of unbelief. So they never prayed and said to God, God, send us a deliverer. Help us out of Egypt. God sent Moses. Moses had a consultation with the leaders, with the elders of the house of Israel, but they never asked for God to, to deliver them. God delivered them, and it was because he of his promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But it was not because they themselves were believers. There were times in Israel's past, in their history, particularly under great leadership, that they did turn to God, that idols were put away, that high places were put away, and that they would probably would be at least a large portion of them as a nation would have sought God, or at least uh, not been into idolatry as a nation. But there's never been a time in history when all Israel, 
every individual in Israel has been saved. But it's going to be that. And so that's what's described in verses 20 uh, through 24, 23, that there's going to come a time that though today in, in, the, in Isaiah's time, it says, though thy people Israel be as the sand of, sea, of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return. The consumption decreed shall overflow with righteousness. And so we see that the remnant in verse 21 shall return, even the remnant of Jacob unto the Almighty God. There's going to be a time when, although it's just a remnant, in other words, it's not the whole part. The best way we understand remnant is uh, we were talking about a couple weeks ago, Isaiah's son, who literally his name meant a remnant shall return. He had two sons, Maharsal, Hashbaz, and uh, a remnant shall return was his name, and so we, we nicknamed him Remnant. And uh, the reason being that he was representative of those individuals that would one day bear God's name. And, but they won't be the, the whole Nash nation of Israel. They'll be that small portion. And that's who God will spare. And when God spares them, they will be the whole nation of Israel. They'll be all that's left. You ever go to a carpet store and buy a remnant to try to find a piece that's big enough maybe to do a smaller room or something like that? Initially, it came on a great big roll, and it's only a small portion of the yardage that was on the roll of carpet, but it's a remnant because it's all that's left from that roll. And this is exactly what God's people are. There's nothing about the word remnant, though, that is to uh, imply that in any way they are inferior or not as good. They are the small number who believe. I want to remind you about this. Don't ever be dismayed when it seems as though most people are against God. Don't be disturbed when it seems as though those individuals that are concerned about right righteousness morality and so forth are only a small group. That's the way it always is and that's the way it'll be until they're all that there is. It's too bad, isn't it, that most individuals don't bow the knee to God? But friend, it's, it's a fact that those who do will be all that God will have when God is through judging the world, judging the earth. And you can always be part of a remnant. So there's a little bit of application there, but that is a future prophecy of what God is going to do someday in Israel. You say, Pastor, it doesn't look like God's doing anything in Israel today. Well, the truth is, is that that's actually a fact. The fact is, is that as a nation nationally, uh, Israel is among the most wicked of the nations. Nationally, Israel just legalized marijuana. Did you notice that? Uh, what was it, last week they just made a decision to make marijuana legal? And, I, you know, I don't want to get into it. Uh, argument or debate about it. I'll be truthful with you. I can't relate to somebody who thinks that uh, drugs uh, that should uh, th that drugs are, are a great idea. In other words, drugs of any kind. Yeah, I've had people say, "Well, Pastor, you know, people on prescription drugs that are just as bad." Uh, I don't have an argument about that. I've had people say before, "If you don't like marijuana, uh, you should have a problem with alcohol." Well, I actually do. Uh, I have a problem because God does. And so, you know, you're not being inconsistent or untruthful. Uh, when, you, or when, or when you take a stand against something. But understand and know this, that when God is through judging the world, judging the earth back on topic, that this remnant is going to be the majority because they're going to be the only ones who are spared God's hand of judgment. And when we talk about judgment, let's remind ourselves of something as well. God is very merciful not to judge the moment we first sin. Many times I thought, well, I wish God would judge the evil ones. And then I thought, I'm glad He doesn't judge the evil ones because there would be no survivors. The Bible says all of sin comes short of the glory of God. That's all of us. And if God were not merciful, and if He were simply to immediately upon uh, individuals trespassing against Him to destroy the wicked, my friend, there'd be no survivors. I'm thankful for God's mercy. And that is exactly what God is doing today. He's being merciful to the world. And He's offering universally for all sinners to be able to come to Jesus Christ and to be able to come to Him through Jesus Christ because Jesus died on the cross for our sins. Now, let's look at verse 20, and I want to just make a point this evening. And so, the Bible says in verse 20, It shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon him that smote him. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's an interesting statement. Who is it that is going to smite the house of Jacob. Well, we know that it's going to be, or that it was prophesied it would be the Assyrians in this case who did. My question for you is this. Post-captivity, after the Syrians, after, after Babylon, when did Israel as a nation turn to God? After the captivity, when did Israel nationally turn to God? 70 years later. For 70 years? 70 years later. 70 years later? Did they, was that a national revival? Because, because no one returned to Jerusalem. That was simply the Jerusalem being rebuilt. 
other words, that was the ones who remained. I don't believe that's the remnant that's being spoken of here uh, in, when you look at the other descriptions of that day. In other words, yes, Nehemiah went back to Jerusalem and he was in dismay that the temple was still destroyed, that the walls were torn down, that the gates hadn't been rebuilt. And they rebuilt the walls. But my friend, that was, uh, you know, in, in a small group, the group of people that were there under Ezra had somewhat of a revival. But as a nation, the nations never returned back to Israel. They never came back and they never moved back to Israel. Today they have what's called Aliyah, where they're encouraging nationally for Israelis, for Jews, to return to Israel. One of the, a couple of the requirements, though, it's very interesting. Somebody was telling me who was Jewish the other day, said that Christians get denied if they find out that you're a Christian returning or you're a believer in, really in Jehovah God. And you don't qualify for the Aliyah. You can't return to that nation. That's not, a, that's not a returning of the nation of Israel, is it? And so the answer is it hasn't happened yet. It's a future event. But I think it's very interesting, this concept of staying upon the Lord. We saw a, a similar concept, and this is something I want to kind of beat home a little bit. One of the reasons that we study Isaiah, one of the ways it's profitable, is that we get to know God and what God thinks and how to worship God subsequently. Look with me back to chapter 8, if you will, please. In verse 12 of chapter 8, this is when God is trying to, uh, when God is warning through, through Isaiah, the king of Judah, Uzziah, about uh, reason and Pekah, the king of Syria, and Pekah, the king of Israel, and his conspiracy against him. Verse 12 of Isaiah 8, God says this to, to Uzziah, Say he not a confederacy to all them to whom this people shall say a confederacy, neither fear ye their fear, nor be afraid. Verse 13, pay attention to this now. Sanctify the Lord of hosts himself, and let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. Now when you read a statement like that, and, you're, and you are thinking of the wicked Assyrian king and the wicked king of Israel coming together to destroy Judah, you think that a fear of those kind of individuals is a bad thing, and indeed it is in context, isn't it? Whereas God does not want us to fear the wicked. But it's interesting that the Scripture says, but let the Lord of hosts be your dread. And we saw several weeks ago the danger in not fearing God but being scared to death of men. And I have to say that it perhaps is more of a tendency or propensity of us to fear men than it is to fear God. It's incredible to me how many times I hear from Christians that you know you try to show them what the Word of God says and what the best or the right thing to do is and many times it's like, well, you know, I'm not going to do this to that person. Or in other words, what they're saying is, I care more about what this person thinks than what God thinks. Heard that many, many times. You know, it's, it's true in almost every instance of our life. Uh, Mark Twain had a quote about it. A lot of people have quoted about money, that we work harder and spend more to impress people that we don't like. Mark Twain said something, Samuel Clements said something to the effect of, we will do more and we will invest more and we will work harder to impress people that we don't even like than we will for those that we love. And boy, it's really true, isn't it? How much we oftentimes sacrifice, how hard we work for something that doesn't even have any real meaning or consequence or that we don't in, aren't invested as far as our love goes. It's uh, kind of true of uh, not just teenagers, but anybody that, that falls into peer pressure, isn't it? You know, it's amazing how someone will dress when they're a young person even if it's really not their style, but because their friends dress that way, they want to dress that way. And it's amazing sometimes how their friends aren't even their friends. I remember being in high school and, you know, and, and uh, remember trying to get the right kind of leather jacket and the right kind of clothes, you know, and the things that were stylish at the time, and then have people check out the brands, you know, and say, oh, that's not the right brand of the same clothes or whatever. You know, you just think, you know, you, you didn't even buy the thing a lot of times because it's what you wanted. You bought it because it's what everybody expected or thought that everyone that was with it or cool should have. And then those people still had a disdain for it. And you think afterward, why did I invest in that when the people that I really did it for don't even like me anyway? When it comes down to it, a lot of times we do things for people. You know, here, here the king of... Judah is concerned about the king of Assyria and he's concerned about the king of Israel who neither of them care about God and neither of them are concerned about spiritual things and yet he cares more about them than he does about what God thinks. You know, that's why as believers we're called to be a peculiar people, a set-apart people. 
It's not because you're supposed to, as a Christian, look weird or act weird. It's because you're supposed to be sanctified to God. In other words, God's supposed to be your fear. He's supposed to be your dread. Yeah, I don't know if you thought much about this, but I have. I thought, why would God want people to dread and to fear Him? You ever thought that? Why would a loving, merciful, kind God want people to dread Him or to fear Him? And I'll be honest with you, the reason for it, simply put, is that a God who is not fearful and dreadful is no God at all. Do you ever think about what if, what if God didn't have the ability to judge evil? When God judges evil, my friend, it'll be a fearful and a dreadful thing. Read Revelation sometime. When God judges evil, I'm going to tell you something, it's terrifying. And even the righteous will be terrified of God's judgment, even though it's not toward them. Why is, it, why is it we ought to fear God? Why is it we ought to have a healthy dread of God? Well, because, my friend, if He's not fearful and dreadful, He's no God. He cannot judge. He cannot do anything. He's a powerless God. A God who is not fearful, a God who is not dreadful, is a powerless God. Now, that does not mean that we have to go around being afraid that in our innocence, God is going to destroy us. First, there are no innocent, but those who are covered by the blood of Jesus are fully covered. But my friend, in every individual who loves God, there ought to be a comprehension that God is fearful and dreadful. And if you fear man more than you fear God, you know, um, God's a God of love, but, but love isn't the predominant attribute of God. And this redefining of God as only love has made Him a God who isn't fearful and who isn't dreadful. And the subsequent Christianity is pretty watered down, I'd have to say, as a result of it. Isn't it so? You know, most Christians aren't afraid of what God... Th they don't care what God thinks about anything. And the reason they don't care what God thinks about anything is because they don't think God will do anything about anything. You know, if I'm going to pray to a God and ask His help, I want a God that can do something about something. If there's wickedness and I want God's staying hand to stop wickedness, I want a God who's fearful and dreadful to pray to, don't you? We don't think very intelligently sometimes along these lines. But the reality of it is that God is, if God is not fearful, God is not dreadful, He is also powerless. He'll never do anything against evil or against the wicked or against anyone. And the truth of the matter is if God never judges evil, I don't need Him. I don't need Him. If He's not going to judge evil, He's not going to judge me. And factually, that's most individuals saved or lost concept of God. I said, God won't do anything about anything. My friend, a God who doesn't do anything about anything is either non-existent or irrelevant. Isn't it so? Now, I want to look at this matter of staying upon because this is insightful not so much about God, but it's insightful about our nature, about our character. Look at back at chapter 10, verse uh, 20, will you please? Chapter 10, and verse 20. The Bible says, It shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel... And such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon him that smote them. Now the word stay means to rest upon or to lean upon, to be held up by or sustained by. Literally, the judgment of the Assyrian king was going to make it so much that the people would be so helpless after after he came and destroyed their country and destroyed them as a people, that without him, without his permission, and without his provision, they could do nothing. You ever wonder how people get into a vassal-like state of being? In other words, how could people happily, you know, be working? You know, you look at, and we, we don't really have a real concept of this, but working like a peasant, if you will, for a lord, who takes almost everything that comes from you, or that, that you work for, takes it from you and leaves you very little left over and can oftentimes even take that. Why would a peasant love his Lord or want to uh, be subservient to his Lord? And the reason would be because he just doesn't have a hope of getting anything anywhere else. In other words, if I don't do that, what will I do? You know, a lot of Christians many times, given a scenario of good and evil, choose evil because they think that at least the evil will provide for them, but God will not. In other words, even though they know something isn't good or someone isn't good, they can't trust God enough to get away from resting or leaning upon the evil thing. This is not a good illustration. All illustrations fall short of the actual text of the Scripture. But, uh, for instance, I have known individuals who have been born again. They've come to, to Jesus, and they've realized that their occupation or their trade when they've gotten saved isn't really something that a Christian could do or that a Christian should do. Uh, 
Dr. Schermerhorn years ago had a man who got saved and he owned a strip club. <coughs> when he got saved, there really wasn't any way that he could be involved with that anymore. And he had to make a choice. Either he was going to uh, continue in a disreputable business or he was going to get rid of it. I've, had, I've led people to the Lord that work as bartenders. And uh, they help people to destroy their lives with drink. And I've watched Christians struggle and say, well, you know, I just can't make the kind of money that I make doing anything else. And ultimately what they're saying is they have more of a fear or more of a dependency or they, la they are leaning more upon what, quote, the devil can do for them than what God can do. And that's precisely the state of Israel. In other words, it isn't that the king of Judah likes the Assyrians. It's just simply that he realizes that if he doesn't please the Assyrians, then they can cause him a lot of trouble. And so he really is trusting what the Assyrians will be do as far as being good to him than he is about what God can do for him. You know the fact of the matter, Christian, is many times when it comes to making spiritual important decisions, we're the same way. You know, a lot of believers, you know, they know that they ought to worship God, they ought to be faithful to serve God, but instead they have to do something else because they don't think God can provide for them. They don't think God can they, they don't think God's good to them. And so they don't stay or they don't rest on God. You know that a Christian who gives financially to God or tithes is demonstrating that he's trusting God. In other words, I'm giving something. You know, I, I I know that there are exceptions to this, but most of the people I know that give to the Lord can't afford to. By, by not afford to, I'm speaking of humanly speaking, human means. In other words, you put in the budget to before you do anything else to give God uh, what you ought to give God. And it's amazing when you look at anybody's budget that there are reasons why anyone, most of the people that I know, there would be some exceptions, but most of the people I know couldn't afford to. And yet when they come to understand that they can afford not to, it's amazing how they give to the Lord and how God honors that and blesses it. It's incredible to me. But it's the truth because it's the same concept. In other words, they're either going to stay upon doing things their own way or the world's way, or they're going to stay or rest or lean upon doing things God's way. You know, the same is true with your time. A lot of believers don't have time to serve the Lord with their lives. And literally, they spend their whole lives just trying to make it because they don't believe God will help them. And so they come to the end of their lives and they realize, I'm out of time. I don't have much time left. And I still don't have time to serve God. My friend, if you trust God, if you believe God, you could rest on Him. And you could let Him be your fear. You could let Him be your dread. But the problem is, is we're more afraid of what a banker could do to us. We're more afraid of... Uh, of what would happen if our credit score weren't what we think would happen to it, or whatever the case were, we think we've got to work the extra job or we've got to do the extra thing, and it's because we fear things or people rather than God. And so I ask myself the question, you should ask yourself the question, what must a person who stays upon the Lord, what must those characteristics be of a person who rests on God? You know, it's really interesting when you read when the disciples asked Jesus to teach them to pray. It's interesting the things that Jesus told His disciples to pray for. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. You know, most believers will not pray Thy will be done to God. Last week, I encountered, I had conversations with believers that we looked at what God's will for their life was and they said, can't be done. In other words, it wasn't because God couldn't enable them to do so. They said, no, I won't accept that. In other words, no, God, your will cannot be done. You know, I believe a Christian who stays upon the Lord would say, thy will be done to God. So many times uh, we would pray for something, we would never ask whether or not the thing we're praying against would be God's will or not. But the very first thing a person who stays on the Lord would pray would be, God, today, thy will be done. In other, God, in other words, God, whatever is good, whatever is best in your plan, I'm in full agreement that it's best in my plan as well. Regardless of the consequence, regardless of the cost, one who dreads, who fears, and stays on the Lord would pray, thy will be done. Many Christians will not pray, thy will be done to God.
And we think or we're faced with a decision or a loss or a difficulty, we won't pray it. God, thy will be done if I like it, but not thy will be done no matter what it is. What's the, what are some other elements of Jesus' prayer? Well, He said, give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. In other words, God, I'm going to trust You to provide for me. I'm going to look at Your Word. I'm going to find out how I'm supposed to live and what I'm supposed to do, and I'm going to trust You to provide for me. <laughs> I remember being single and praying for a wife and uh, thinking in my mind that this is a very difficult thing to ask God to give me. My concern was that God would give me a wife I didn't like. <laughs> right? I mean, what if she's just, you know, hard to look at? You know, what if God does that to me? And <laughs> Charlie will tell you this because he has he's had way more of these conversations. I always stop these conversations when they got started when I was in college. But guys would talk about should you be willing to marry an ugly girl? Should you be willing to marry an ugly girl? In other words, God, thy will be done. She's ugly, but it's your will. I'll do whatever you want me to do, God. And guys debating about, could you, could you ever be right with the Lord and marry a girl that you thought was ugly? And so Just nonsense. You know what that all assumes? You know what it assumes? It assumes that God isn't good. It assumes God isn't good. I remember the day I prayed and said, God, whoever you want me to marry, I'll marry him, and I'll like it. Because I know what you're like. In other words, God made me. And He knows the things that I desire, things that I like, and God made my wife for me. How in the world could God make me and make my wife for me, and if I'm surrendered to His will, me not like it? See, He's a good God. And the assumption an individual makes when they don't rest or stay on the Lord is that He's not good. And so we don't depend on God. So, uh, God, Thy will be done, but also, God, I'm trusting You to provide for me. I'm trusting you to provide for me. In other words, God, this is right, I'll do right. I've said it many times, but it's a truth that's worth considering, that doing right wouldn't be a decision if it were the easiest thing to do. Therefore, doing right is almost always the hardest thing to do until you're conditioned just to do right. Isn't it so? Doing the right thing's tough. And if it weren't tough, it wouldn't be a debate or a decision. It'd be the easy thing, and you just do the easy thing, and it'd happen to be right. So it's nice, isn't it, when doing the right thing is the easy thing? How often is it much of a consideration? Sometimes we're given a dilemma. Maybe it's a moral dilemma, or maybe it's a sacrificial dilemma, but it's the right thing to do, and we struggle with it, and the reason we struggle with it is because it's right, and it's hard, and it's difficult. But really our struggle is that we don't trust God to provide for us. In other words, if I pay this like I'm supposed to, I, Christians call me sometimes, should I pay my bills? Is it right to pay your bills? Yeah, it is. Is it the right thing to do to pay your bills? Well, sure it is. You say, Pastor, there's legal things that you can do in order to not pay your bills. Well, legal and right aren't always the same thing, you know. Isn't it so? There are things I can legally do that aren't right to do. And should I pay my bills? Well, is it right to pay your bills? It certainly is. Well, if I pay my bills, I won't have anything left for me. I won't have enough. I can't do right. Well, what about trusting God? Can God do anything? Could God provide for you? Sure He could. Give us this day our daily bread. That's a tough one, isn't it? How about this? When we pray to God, we ought to say that will be done. We ought to pray to God. When we pray to God, we ought to recognize that God can provide for us. But how about just dwelling on and conversing on and focusing on God? See, God wanted Israel to stay on Him, and the idea is lean on Him. And the idea of leaning on Him really carried with it the concept of just be aware of Him as a God. I wonder how much we're staying on God when we don't pray. I wonder how much we're staying on God's Word when we don't just spend time in His Word and seeking Him. You know, if you were to take the word seeking and understand its definition and define or lay out for yourself how much you sought God today, I wonder how much we've stayed on God ourselves. How much have we sought God? You know, most of the time when it comes to decisions, we don't seek God. I can handle this. This is what I want to do. 
And we, when we uh, go a direction or we determine something, we don't seek God. We don't spend time praying and saying, God, will you help me? See, we can talk about Israel. We can look at Israel and we can see how terrible it is that they have more fear for a wicked Assyrian king who doesn't love them and who's going to do evil to them than a God who wants to bless them. But the reality of it is, my friend, is that the same is true for us if we don't seek God. We don't seek Him. We don't lean on Him. We don't rest on Him. We don't desire Him. You know, it's very interesting when you read the Lord's Prayer then when Jesus teaches His disciples, He uses the illustration of the fact that God is good. He says, um, Which of you, having a child, if He asks you for a fish, will for a fish give Him a serpent? Or for an egg, you ask Him for an egg and give Him a scorpion, or you give Him uh, for bread, you give Him a rock. What good father... You know, ha ha, here's a rock. And it's like, okay, the joke's over, now give me bread. No, I just, I really gave you a rock instead of bread. We're not talking about God pranking somebody. We're saying, God, God, I need bread. And God says, here's a rock instead of bread. And that's really what it gives you. Or God, can I have a fish? And God says, here's a scorpion. And that's what it gives you. Or God, here's a serpent. Or fish, or can I have a fish? And God gives a serpent. In other words, what kind of a heavenly or earthly father would do that who would, that loves their child? And then Jesus said, If ye then being evil, that is, you're sinful, God isn't. If ye then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall God give His Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? How much more? Who is good, righteous, holy, and who is not? God or us? Who's good? God or us? We're not good. God is. Well, if God's good, and we know how to be good, isn't the idea that God will do much more so? Then, my friend, why is it that we have a tendency not to stay or lean or rest on God? Because we're just the same as Israel many times, even those who know Him. God wants us to lean on Him. God wants us to rest on Him. <laughs> Two Sunday nights ago, uh, Josiah threw a rock into my calf and blew, up, blew it up, right? That's what it felt like. But actually, my, for no reason, my calf muscle tore. And I'll tell you something. When By the time the service was over, I was feeling like passing out when I was preaching uh, Sunday night. By the time the service was over, that thing had locked up so badly, my, my toe was down and I couldn't straighten it up. And I couldn't walk out of here. I mean, I could hop or hobble or whatever, but I needed something to lean on. So I, my wife got my office chair and I got outside and made it, you know. Taj offered me his crutches, but he didn't give them to me. So <laughs> didn't have that. Um, but it's a good illustration sometimes when you can't walk or you can't stand that you need someone to lean on. Or you need something to lean on. It's the very idea of it. And yet, in our pride, when it comes to God, we don't want to lean on anyone or anything, and we don't want to lean on God. We want to trust Him. It's a pretty good illustration of it. Because the truth of the matter is, is that when it comes to ability, we don't have any. And when it comes to God, He has all of it. And so we ought to just lean on Him. We ought to trust Him. Nationally, what hope, what prayer, physically speaking, did Israel have or Judah have against Israel and the king of Assyria? And the answer to it is not a prayer. And so she sought her enemy to lean on him instead of seeking God to lean on him. And I fear, my friend, when it comes to the wicked one, when it comes to evil, in our strength, we don't have any strength. But how often we pray God for His Holy Spirit and beg Him and say, God, I need Your Spirit. I need Your Spirit for victory. I need your spirit for power. And God, I need your provision. I need you. And to seek Him as one who stays or leans on Him. There's an old saying about enemies, right? Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Why would you keep your enemies closer? Well, for observation, so you know where they're at. You know, it'd be kind of a bad thing if, as a vassal state, you didn't really know what was going on with the state you're subservient to. 
kind of want to know what's going on so that you can make sure they're always happy or pleased. If they're not pleased, you're in a lot of trouble. And that's the way individuals are for those who are their enemies. But it's amazing that we have a God in heaven who loves us, can provide for us, and can protect us. And His will for us is good. And yet we don't want to lean on Him. And if you want to look in Isaiah and you want to understand what God wants from His people, we know, we saw a couple weeks ago that God wanted righteousness and judgment. You know what else God wants? God wants us to lean on Him. He wants us to trust Him. Do you lean on God? Do you trust God? I don't know what everybody's going through here tonight. Everybody's at a different place, different state of life. Everyone has different needs. But the question is, where do you lean for your needs, for your provision? Man's strength, man's ability, even those who are against you, or God in heaven, who has all the ability, whose will is good, and who is for you. Father, I pray that you'd help us to have discernment, and Lord, to on purpose practice leaning on you. We pray in Jesus' name.